This is the one, the, well, we're going to kick off, I guess, uh, this is a two-part series here, uh, looking at Honeybee Thurman Window. Um, and uh, I'm just going to sort of orient everyone within the larger series, just uh, just in case you're, you're, you're coming in uh, part of the way through the, the longer 12, 12 or 14 somewhat uh, part series that we have all together. Uh, so just so you guys know, um, today we're going to be mostly covering, uh, uh, just we're going to be mostly working just with Therm. Uh, with opaque constructions, wall constructions, uh, and I'm going to just give a little bit of background as to you know why Therm is important, why what are the different ways that we can use it, um, because certainly it's also it's it's um, very much a program that has uh, applications in a wide variety of areas uh, that are beyond the initial sort of statement of uh, I guess the purpose statement that was used to to in create it initially. Uh, so we're actually going to we're actually this whole presentation today is actually not even going to be about uh, Therm's original purpose, uh, which was to model framing systems for windows uh, and, and understand the heat flow that happens through those. Uh, we're going to be just looking at it to, to model opaque constructions today uh, and understand a, a phenomena called thermal bridging, which you maybe are, are all pretty familiar with. Uh, and then we're going to model a few different construction details, a few different options, uh, uh, just to show you guys some of the potentials, uh, particularly especially of having the uh, therm interface in, uh, um, in, in uh, Rhino Grasshopper, which is what essentially Honeybee uh, is connecting, is allowing you to do. Um, all right, and then next one, next Tuesday, we're going to be importing um, Window, window uh, being another LBNL uh, piece of software, much just like Therm, also from LBNL, uh, and we're going to be importing glazing systems from there, building window frames, working with more of the traditional uh, reason why window was initially created, uh, and then we're going to be incorporating the results that we get from Therm into an Energy Plus simulation. All right, so with that, today's specific schedule, I'm just going to give a kind of intro to Therm, just talk uh, very broadly and high level about, uh, you know, why it's useful, uh, why why I decided, I guess, about a year ago that uh, that uh, we should build a connection in Honeybee uh, between Rhino Grasshopper and Therm, uh, and, then, uh, and then just talk a little bit about how we traditionally model constructions. I'm actually going to be looking at, at Honeybee's uh, construction libraries uh, to give you guys a sense of at least what are the assumptions that we have been making as we have built energy models, energy plus models in Honeybee, uh, and how are we going to make those more accurate and more meaningful with Therm. Uh, and then finally, we're going to spend most of the day is going to be about building a Therm model, unpacking the results, understanding what's going on. Uh, and then finally, we're going to do a comparison of design options in the last part. So, all right, so that's today's schedule, uh, and just so you guys know where we are in the larger honeybee, so again, like the first, this whole series kicked off looking at working with Ladybug, uh, which to some extent we still are because honeybee builds off of Ladybug, um, but uh, yeah, but whereas we spent a good four, four sessions covering the energy modeling capabilities, uh, which we're going to come back to next session because that's, that's something that the Therm... Uh, 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 components help a lot with is making these energy simulations more accurate. Uh, we just spent two sessions on daylighting and, and electric lighting and glare analysis. Um, and then finally now we are in this realm. We're in the last the last branch of the, the Honeybee web uh, of where we're looking at Honeybee's connection to Thurman Window, um, which uh, mostly, mostly we're going to be looking at construction R&U value evaluation with Thurman Window. Uh, but it's also useful for condensation risk, and I'll reference that a few times today. Um, all right, so with that, um, let's, yeah, let's just dive right in. So I'm going to give a bit of an intro to sort of explain why I thought it was a good idea to build a connection between LB and L Thurman window uh, and, uh, and, and Honeybee and, and Rhino Grasshopper, uh, and sort of what are the things that we get out of it, so if you guys kind of understand, uh, you know, what, what are the motivations. Um, so. Uh, I mean, first, I should probably, before I explain any of that, I have to kind of explain what Therm is, uh, because, well, one, we might have people coming in from different aspects of the industry, and Therm is going to have a different meaning for you, depending on uh, what background you're coming from, probably. Or it might have, you know, you might sit between multiple meanings if, uh, if you have a foot in different disciplines. Uh, so first, maybe to say that we can break it down into three 
few different types of definitions depending on the you know the background that you're coming from, uh, and of course you know n no one person necessarily fits into one of these categories beautifully. You might be straddling a couple or all three even, uh, but really to uh, to the design process to the architectural designer. Uh, Therm is primarily, it's a means of evaluating the thermal performance of your construction details. Uh, and this is, you know, primarily what Therm means to most of the people in my office, in the architecture office where I work. Um, and it's, yeah, and it's mostly made to help you model and understand how, how well insulated your, your different uh, construction details are. Uh, and your different construction systems as well. It does, you know, obviously what you learn from your details can be extrapolated up to, um, to, to larger types of systems so that you can make smarter judgment calls about that. Uh, and so this is, yeah, this, uh, these are details anywhere from things like uh, uh, foundations and footings uh, are, are a key area where you tend to get a lot of heat flow and lose a lot of insulation. Uh, things like uh, uh, window frames also tend to be areas where you can lose a lot of um, a lot of insulative performance and uh, and just a number of there a lot of joints and connections tend to be you tend it's easy to get heat flow through them and to compromise the sort of insulative nature of your envelope and so as an architectural designer that's really what therm helps you understand uh, to go maybe more from a building scientist perspective uh, Therm is it's a, it's a free application created by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs uh, and it's supported by the U.S. Department of Energy. And, uh, and it's made to promote energy conscious envelope specifications and, uh, and aid research into thermal bridging. Uh, thermal bridging being this general phenomena of smaller members compromising uh, the whole insulative performance of our constructions. Uh, and so really, yeah, from more of a building science perspective, you might use this for research as a, well, I guess the key, the biggest example I can give of this is Andrea Love, uh, the senior building scientist in, uh, in my office here. Uh, used Therm, I want to say, three or four years ago uh, to do a very detailed report of whole, a whole different set of construction systems uh, that she modeled in Therm. And she used it for research purposes to really help inform what are the best ways that we can, uh, we can, we can build constructions that are, that are better insulated. Um, and then finally to the computer or data nerd or uh, you know, software developer maybe, which is definitely one that I keep a, a healthy foot in, uh, is that our uh, Therm is, in, in this sense, it's a 2D meshing and finite element heat transfer engine that models conductive and radiative uh, steady state heat flow. Uh, so, <laughs> so you could tell I went to a hardcore nerd in this definition. Uh, and so some of you may have gotten some parts of that. I, I don't blame you if you don't understand uh, what everything is that means. But, um, but the, key, the key thing is that we're, we're modeling heat transfer. We're doing a detailed model of heat transfer. Uh, we're using a mathematical method called finite element uh, to solve that heat transfer. Uh, it's an assumption of steady state, which I'm going to describe a little bit later. Uh, so it's really it's just meant to only indicate a kind of point in time or like an idealized point in time simulation. It's not meant to be uh, over necessarily modeled over a long period of time. Um, and yeah, and it's primarily modeling conduction, heat conduction through envelopes. All right, so to kind of break this down a little bit more and to sort of explain what do we get out of a connection between uh, a rhino grasshopper and uh, endtherm, uh, what, what is it that Honeybee is really doing for us? And it's going to obviously have a different uh, meaning for you depending on the kind of, again, the camp that you're coming from. Um, so uh, just to sort of say what, what exactly, what are the benefits we get from this Rhino grasshopper and therm of which I'm, I'm taking an image of here, a uh, screenshot from Rhino that's, that's output by the grasshopper components. Uh, and so from the, from the sort of architectural standpoint, what are the biggest benefits that we get by having this connection uh, that Honeybee provides between uh, rhino grasshopper and therm is that we get a, a much more agreeable or, or more familiar, maybe I'll say, drawing interface uh, in order to create our construction details. Uh, and so, well, I guess maybe to give a little bit more background and detail of why why is it that well, a lot of us understand how how rhino can be a, a particularly good interface. I mean, for drawing, uh, it's you know it's been in development for. I want to say like two and a half decades, like of people, you know, there's been a team of devoted people revising to make a better and better drawing interface. And so understandably, there are a lot of advantages uh, that it has over, um, over uh, um, I mean, the, the currently existing uh, built-in drawing interface for Therm, uh, which only sort of came about um, as, as a means to, 
so that we have some way to input things into into the finite heat element engine. But that again isn't really the primary objective of Therm. It isn't really meant to be a drawing interface. It's meant to be a finite element heat modeler. Um, so just to kind of compare these two, I mean. I mean, they may look very, very much the same. This is a, a rhino model that I have of a construction detail that I modeled in Therm. Uh, and then, you know, in Therm, you see the same exact thing. They're both drawing interfaces. Uh, and then while they may look very similar, um, you know, from, from the start, and in one sense, yeah, they are, they, you know, they are, they are both drawing interfaces, so we'd expect them to be fairly similar. Uh, you know, with Wino, we know we have things like uh, some very detailed object snaps that we can really easily turn on and off in all different ways, trimming operations. We've got hundreds of geometry commands, the ability to import 25 plus file types of DWTs, JPEGs, PDFs, SketchUp files. We've got 20 plus unit systems, and we've got, I mean, Probably actually, maybe even still one of the biggest things is that it's familiar to many of us because many of us uh, design a lot of things in Rhino, um, and uh, especially yeah, things like construction details where they're at least existing in some type of CAD interface, whether it's Rhino or AutoCAD, uh, before we would think of, of uh, modeling them in in the Therm interface. And so it's it's very useful to have uh, be able to build your Therm model essentially in Rhino, which is what Honeybee allows. Um, rather than having to build it completely from scratch in, in Therm, where, uh, where, I mean, and I will say not to knock the Therm drawing interface, because it is very impressive for the, you know, the amount of time that, that uh, they've had to work on it, but, I mean, understandably, Rhino has been very well developed, um, as, as of a lot of these other professional softwares. So, all right, uh, and so with that, I mean, just to kind of, so you guys have a sense of the workflow that we're going to be working with today, and this is actually going to get even shorter, so right now it's kind of a four-step process. Um, but really, I mean, the way that it works is that you're going to draw all of your geometry in Rhino as a start, as you see I've done here. Um, and whereas previously, I mean, you might try and, and export that into Therm, uh, you know, there'd always be some disruptions, things wouldn't, wouldn't be lining up correctly, uh, and inevitably you'd have to redraw everything in Therm usually, no matter, even if you had drawn in the CAD interface at first. Uh, but in this way, you can draw your, your, all of your geometry in Rhino, you assign materials in Grasshopper, uh, by passing, you know, each of these sets of, of geometries through a component that assigns a material to them. Uh, then you have a little component that exports all of those polygons together and boundary conditions into, into the Therm, where you can open it up in Therm and just hit simulate. You don't have to draw anything in the Therm interface if you don't want to, uh, although you can if you want to complete your model there. Uh, but yeah, but essentially then you just simulate in Therm and then you could import the results back into Rhino and, you know, play with the data in Grasshopper. Uh, do all sorts of different things there, uh, or you know, and, and with that goes hand in hand that you can uh, you know work things into your Energy Plus, your Honeybee Energy Plus simulations as well. So this is kind of what we're going to be covering today, just the uh, going through step by step. Uh, and thankfully, I will say maybe I'll say this all the way at the start, just in case people have to leave early at any point. But um, but this actual step of having to open open and simulate in Therm, which is really the only thing that stops us from making very parametric models right now. Uh, thankfully, uh, uh, LBNL has decided to open up their command line interface for Therm and make it free for everyone. Uh, so it, within a, probably, I want to say like another month or so. You won't have to open it up in Therm if you don't want to. You'll be able to directly simulate from Grasshopper. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I just I thought I should say that now. And special thanks also to LBNL for, for opening up their command line interface. Uh, yeah, don't worry, LBNL. You're going to be thanked many times throughout this presentation. Um, all right, so and I will say just one other thing. At the moment, Honeybee, it's the only CAD plugin for Therm. Uh, really, I mean, because Therm is so new, I mean, I, I won't probably be able to say this for too long because I imagine once people realize that we can build uh, CAD interfaces for Therm, uh, there'll be a lot more that follow. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, this is really the only way that uh, you can take stuff directly from a CAD interface, in this case Rhino, uh, and export it into Therm and have everything ready to go. Um, so. All right, so I just wanted to, to say that. Um, I should also maybe say this is the, the, the only CAD interface, and this presentation is also the first time I'm actually doing a video presentation of how to use the components. So you guys are lucky for many, many firsts here. Um, <laughs> so all right, so with that, uh, let's say. So we kind of covered from the architectural design standpoint, you get a more agreeable uh, drawing interface. Uh, from the building science perspective, which is Technically, that's my title here uh, at, at the office where I work. Um, and really, one of the biggest things I'm going to get at is it's going to be an easier means of integrating Therm with uh, full building energy models. Uh, because I build all of my, my energy models a lot of the times with, um, 
with honeybee. Uh, and so I really I purposely tried to make the therm components as tightly connected to those energy simulation components. Uh, so it's easy to walk between those two worlds. Um, so not only, I mean, I should also say from a research perspective, having a parametric interface for therm, which, which Grasshopper essentially is, also opens up some interesting research possibilities. But I'm going to talk about at least this one right now, because that's probably, this is one of the most meaningful for the building scientist one. Uh, and just to sort of talk briefly, just to give a very brief introduction to what thermal bridging is. Um, so just in case anyone hasn't heard this term before. Um, so thermal bridging, I mean, maybe the best way to start to explain it is to say that, um, you know, all of our models are in some sense abstractions of reality. Um, so when we, you know, when we model constructions in our full building energy models, they aren't really, you know, we're not modeling all the little details possibly of the construction. Uh, they're an abstraction which has just the most important parameters that we need to, you know, understand the energy use and comfort in the space. Um, so, I mean, what does this mean for thermal bridging? So, really, when we run energy models, we tend to think of our constructions as, you know, you know, continuous tier material. So we have like a brick outer face, we have a continuous air cavity, and we have a continuous insulation. And there, you know, and you know, there's nothing in between. There's no structural members. There's no then like the uh, little clips or studs or any of the things that that actually connect this construction together. Uh, and so while this is kind of how we tend to run our constructions through energy models, uh, we know in reality things are much more like this. So we're going to have, let's say, a metal stud in our wall. Uh, and, you know, instead of the temperature just increasing, you know, gradually as you go from one side of the insulation to another, um, you know, we're going to have these pieces of metal that are going to conduct the heat from one side, from the interior side, to the exterior side. And they're going to conduct that heat much more than, uh, than the insulation will. And so this phenomenon that we call about, talk about when we you know, start to put in structural members and all the things that hold our, our facade together, uh, we call these, these sort of metal or highly conductive pieces, we call them thermal bridges, because they're essentially creating a bridge from our, our nice warm interior to our cold exterior uh, using a highly conductive uh, piece of, of metal. Uh, and so that's, what, that's really what you're seeing here in this temperature distribution is that, you know, you're seeing that heat flow uh, through that. So thermal bridging, it's, it's very, uh, especially in like a colder climate like the one where I'm in right now in Boston, thermal bridging is, is an enormous contributor, uh, especially in historic buildings, to uh, to heat loss. Uh, and so, I mean, this is just to show you, we're going to actually simulate this later in the, in the, uh, in, in, uh, the, the presentation here. But, you know, it's really, it's almost like the difference of, like, I, I actually quote a statistic from one of the, from the thermal bridging report that, uh, that Andrew Lovett put together uh, four years ago in, in, at Payette, that it usually, you know, uh, account for it will degrade the thermal performance of your envelope anywhere from about 20% uh, all the way up to 70%. So that's a 70% loss in R value. Uh, and that's kind of similar to what you're seeing here. I guess is about like, it looks like about a 40% loss. That these, these thermal bridges can be enormously uh, compromising to the performance of your envelopes. Uh, and so the way that we detail our constructions, the, the construction systems that we choose, have an enormous impact on the amount of heat that we're going to need in winter because, because they will create thermal bridges across these envelopes uh, if we don't design it well. And also, I mean, if anything, that range is enormous from 20% up to 70%. So you could, you could be completely trashing your entire envelope uh, if you're not accounting for thermal bridges very well. Uh, or, or, you know, if you're doing a good job, you, you know, you, you could almost minimize it to, to be, you know, at, at least far smaller than 70%, that's for sure. All right, and so this is just showing you another way of our kind of understanding thermal bridges. So these are some thermal images for, taken from the inside in the winter. Uh, and these are just looking at some wall constructions. And what you're seeing, actually, just in the same way that I showed you these stud constructions, uh, you're seeing these studs in the wall. Even so, this is this is a perfectly flat, you know, finished gypsum wall on the inside. But when you look at it in the thermal perspective, you see that these, these portions, these vertical stripes, are areas that are much colder, and that's because you have the studs, uh, the the steel studs in the wall, and you have heat conducting through those so fast here. Uh, and I mean, in a worst case scenario, you know, it could end up looking something like this from the exterior. 
where you just, you know, you, you build a very well insulated house, but you just have an enormous amount of heat flow through these studs, uh, you know, when you look at it in the thermal, uh, in, in, from a thermal perspective. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't really matter how well insulated the rest of your house is, it's because you have these steel studs, all your heat is just conducting through them. Everything is being lost through your envelope that way. Um, and so maybe I'll show you a few other images from, I mean, there are a lot of good thermal images from the report uh, that I keep referencing. Um, but yeah, but this is, it's a widespread phenomenon that you could really see. I mean, you could, it's, if you guys ever get the chance to take a thermal camera around your neighborhood uh, and just, you know, look at the different buildings, you'll be amazed. You'll see thermal bridges everywhere. It's like, you know, seeing a whole other dimension of our world. Um, anyway, <laughs> so this is just so you guys know, understand what thermal bridges are. Um, and so, I mean, and, and so it's very important ultimately at the end of the day therm is allowing us to you know in a very very accurate way try and model what these thermal bridges the effect of them are because obviously they matter so much they're very small details they can be very hard to quantify uh, especially when we're assuming these continuous insulation constructions um, you know for our energy models uh, or these very simplified versions of, of constructions um, and so and so that's where Therm really helps and makes, it makes our, our full building energy models more accurate by allowing us to quantify this. Uh, and it also helps us choose more, you know, uh, constructions that make much more sense, that perform better. Uh, another sort of thing I just, just want to, while I'm in the building science area here, I just want to explain briefly what I mean by steady state versus dynamic simulations and why eventually we take the results from our Therm models and we put them into um, into energy plus models or models of full buildings, not just of the construction detail. Uh, and so again, I'm going to use this phrase to say that all models are abstractions of reality. So steady state is an abstraction of what actually happens in the world in the same way that our, you know, our constructions are, are, that we put into our energy models are abstractions of what we actually build. Uh, and so, you know, our third model shows this at, you know, at a single point in time. We assume that the inside is a single temperature that's uniform, maybe like 21 Celsius. We assume the outside is a uniform temperature at 18 Celsius, uh, minus 18 Celsius. Uh, these, these are numbers, by the way, that are typically used for, you know, for evaluating uh, uh, U values and R values, or, you know, those, those insulative performance values of the construction. Um, and then, you know, but what actually happens is that, you know, the temperature on the inside is never, is, you know, is never a, just a purely constant value. Uh, certainly the temperature on the outside is going all over the place, you know, that you never actually get this perfectly, uh, you know, steady state condition. And, uh, and in reality, it varies from hour to hour and hour. Uh, and really, I mean, if, the, if I can give any indication of this, because I just started doing some physical testing with, uh, with you know, uh, of some constructions in our, uh, in our building science group this year, and it is so difficult. You need to wait usually for a good, like, two days to get anything that really resembles steady state. <laughs> It's, uh, you know, reality is much more complex. Things are changing very much so dynamically. Uh, so, I mean, so that's just to be aware that our therm, you know, while our therm has a very good spatial resolution where we can model all these details to a very high, high spatial resolution, uh, you know, it's simplifying what we lose when we build a therm model is that we're simplifying the time dimension and that we're only looking at a single point in time of a steady state simulation. Uh, whereas our, our sort of our energy plus simulations, which are dynamic, um, they're making that over simplified assumption about the construction, assuming these, uni you know, these generally uniform materials uh, without a really high spatial resolution, but they're modeling everything dynamically from, you know, one, one you know, minute to the next. Uh, and because of that, uh, because of that, you know, it's got a very more, much more accurate temporal understanding of what's happening, uh, but not, not necessarily as much of a spatial detailed understanding. So a lot of times what we'll do is that we'll model, uh, you know, stuff in therm, get an R value, uh, and then we'll plug that R value into our energy plus simulations to understand the impact on the energy use and the comfort and that things over a longer period of time. Uh, and so this is really, um, and maybe also just to say that you don't want to just stop at the third model. You know, R value isn't necessarily true value. You know, true value are things maybe like energy savings or, you know, or comfort, increases in occupant comfort, that, you know, things that we can readily recognize as valuable. R value, it's, you know, it's a bit of an abstraction to kind of understand exactly, or, you know, it's a second order set of value. It's not, it's not directly, uh, 
uh, it doesn't doesn't necessarily directly mean that you're going to have uh, less energy use or more comfort. Um, all right, and so really, then again, and the real thing that Honeybee gives us is that it's connecting these two in you know in a one solid workflow, all within Grasshopper, um, so that uh, so that you guys can can actually uh, so it's easier to walk between these two worlds uh, rather than having two separate interfaces that you can keep them all in the same place. All right, and finally, and this by the end of uh, the next the last session, we're going to actually uh, we're going to be modeling plugging at least the results we get from Thurm into Energy Plus simulations. All right, and then finally, uh, yeah, maybe just before the last bit of, you know, covering up the last bit of value is I just want to make some important notes about this interface, uh, especially because I, I don't want, uh, particularly if people don't know Honeybee or, or, uh, or Grasshopper too well, uh, you should know that the Thurm components are a good way to start off. Um, so the reason for that is that you don't need to know full building energy simulation in order to use Therm. Uh, you know, you can use it just to evaluate the performance of your constructions and, you know, pass that on to another energy model who's do, doing something else. So you don't need to know this full building energy simulation. Uh, it's just there if you want to build off of it. Um, one thing else I would say, the Therm models, they're, they're much less complex than full building models. Um, you know, you just have a few a set of materials and, you know, a single point in time that you're looking at. Uh, and so for that reason, you know, I might recommend if you're just getting into Honeybee that starting with the Therm components can actually be a good way to do that. And then, you know, once you get the hang of that, that might lead you into doing things like full building energy simulations. Uh, but yeah, but it's a lot less complex, much fewer components you'll see on our Grasshopper canvases than what we've been doing in the rest of the series. Uh, and then finally, um, the, uh, the Therm components that I've that I've uh, developed in Honeybee, uh, they're not, they're, we, we have a lot of restrictions that govern the types of geometry that you can use in, in for the rest of Honeybee. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we, we kind of make you build your Rhino model, or at least convert it over to meters in order to run an Energy Plus, because Energy Plus is all in meters, uh, and it's, it's really, uh, it's a lot to convert everything over. Uh, uh, automatically, or there's bound to be some mistakes. But the thin components, because they're simple enough, you can use any unit system, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, whether you want to use inches or millimeters or, you know, yeah, you're not beholden to the same, um, to the same crazy things that we, you know, we make you adhere to for a full building energy model. Uh, you know, and it's very simple stuff. You really just need, uh, you can plug in all different types of geometries too, whether they're polylines or, um, or other things. The only, you know, the only thing you need to make sure is that everything's in the same place.